So it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Um, Marion McAlpine may be known to a number of you, mm -hmm. but also to some new members of her gatherings. <laughs> and she, after a career in critical management, research and teaching, uh, will speak on her work developing photography skills to raise and communicate critical concerns. She created, with the help of others, three much-viewed traveling exhibitions about the implications of privatization of public services, including the NHS. At the same time, she started making what she calls photography books, one of which, right at once and in detail, she will discuss in this seminar. It is my very great pleasure this evening to welcome her and all of you and those attending online to this seminar this evening. And she is happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jana, very much. And thank you all for coming. And thank you to the people on Zoom as well. And also thank you to Charmian, who came to an another talk that I gave and kindly. I know Charmian's got a, a very important role in this centre as well as Jana. So thank you all. So this is the book that I'm going to talk about. Um, my mother was from Austria and she was from an assimilated Jewish family. She came to England in 1936 and she married my English father in 1938. She never told us what happened to her parents and her two brothers, so I never knew. There was a big silence. She called herself Austrian. She never called herself Jewish. Once I asked my mother if she remembered where her mother was buried. She spread her arms out like this and she said, I can't remember. And that was very significant to me. And the silence was very powerful. And actually, most of the time when we used to go and visit her, I would forget to ask her. But then, yes, sorry. Most of the time when I when we went to visit her, I would forget to ask her. The silence is very pervasive. Um, but um, yes. But then I did find out something. She kept a hat box by the fireplace. Can you hear me now? Not very well. Not very well. Perhaps I should stand up. <laughs> she kept a hat box by the fireplace. Um, in her house. Um, I knew it was full of letters because she'd given me one or two and I'd had them translated. Um, <clears throat> a few years before she died, she, didn't, she died at 101 in just before COVID, thank goodness. Um, but I noticed that the hat box wasn't there and I said, oh, what have you done with it? And she said, uh, oh, I had to get rid of all that. So I did go out to the dustbin <laughs> without her seeing and I found this very clean bag full of very tiny, torn up bits of letters. Um, and she, it was a dilemma. She'd wanted to fill them. I had this big silence to fill. I wanted to see if I could make any sense of them. So I don't know what you would have done. I know some people in the room has, have faced a similar dilemma. Um, what I did was I didn't look at them, but I took the bag home to London and I put it on a high shelf. And some years later, I took it down. So this book is about, first of all, the process of finding out. They were tiny little scraps of paper, shreds of paper, some of them letters, some of them envelopes. So it was finding out, trying to put them together, a kind of detective story, which I'll say a little bit about. It's about the very strongly delineated characters that um, emerged from this work of some of my relatives and other people. And it's also about old photographs, um, how they come to, they can be quite emotional and I'm quite interested in what causes that. Um, a photography curator said, photography is always about time, time passed, <coughs> time caught, time lost. So is it the fact that it's about time lost? So as you're looking at some of these photographs that I will show, I'd be very interested later on in how you respond. Is it just because it's my family that I found? Is it just because it's my family that I found them moving? 
or so as I say, I would like to know what you think. So I want to show you first of all some of the some of the family. So this is my mother. She was age six <coughs> at the time. She was called Nolly in Austria. Um, she when she to England she was called Eleanor, but she was Nolly. That is her mother, Mimi, and we'll hear a lot about her because she wrote lots and lots of the letters. My grandmother. This is her younger brother, Otto. And again, there's quite a lot from him that we'll hear about. And this is Hans, the older boy on the, that side. And uh, very sadly, there's very little about him in the letters. And I think he had some sort of disability. It was never clear what. He may have had a cleft palate, but there's very little about him in the letters. There was one rather scrubby little letter he could write, definitely, but he was hardly ever referred to. And um, it's very tragic because probably he was invisible in life as he was is in the letters. So, um, yes, and this was um, my grandfather. He was married to Mimi, my grandmother, but they did get divorced um, early 30s. And that was very significant in terms of my grandmother's poverty. She refers a lot in her to come in the chairs, etc. Um, yes, she refers a lot to having very little money. Um, she was divorced, she was middle class, there was no question it seemed of getting a job. So she needed a man, and we'll hear she needed another husband. We'll hear a bit more about that. So the process of putting this is just a few of some of the hundreds and hundreds of little bits of paper. And I did at some point start putting them together. <coughs> can you hear me now? Sorry. <laughs> You're talking very quietly. Uh, uh, can you just kind of project? Okay. Try and reach the back of the room. <laughs> Sorry, yes. <coughs> Let me take another drink. <laughs> no, you need the microphone. Ah, yes, I need to be near. Does this, yeah. Okay, I'll try and speak a bit louder. Please tell me if you can't hear me. Um, so I found these fragments. Some had blue edges, some had brown, that very beautiful um, old letter paper, writing paper, very thin. The envelopes, some had blue, some had brown. So I was trying to match those up with the letters as well. Some were in, Eng some were in English, a few. Most of them were in German and I had to get them translated. The color of the ink, quite a lot were written in pencil and really just scribbled. It was like a jigsaw. And I also used the subject matter and continuity in putting the fragments together. So I'll just give you um, an example of people I didn't know. I didn't know a lot of the people. So they seemed, my, my mother seemed to have two male friends. One was called Dr. Lejra Aladar. And can you hear me now? Yes. Um, and he seemed to be a lawyer in Budapest. They used to go to Budapest as well here. Um, and then there was another guy called, she wrote to Dear Ali Baba. And of course, to start with, I thought it was two separate men or young men. And then um, I, I found that I would put a letter together, which seemed to be to um, Alada. As you can see, she said, I'm writing to you even on a beautiful day and not only when it's raining. It was quite a flirty sort of letter. Um, even if you've not said sorry till now, I will do that. So please, Alibaba, oh, this one was said to dear Alibaba, don't be angry with me. You will repeat that I tend to be argumentative, but as long as you are the only one to claim that I am, I'm not very concerned. By the way, did you, in, did you integrate the word kind into your vocabulary? I'm convinced that you'll be able to use it. <laughs> and what was interesting to me was my mother, when she was older, she never used irony. You know, she, she was totally straightforward. I can't remember anything she said of that kind. So, can I point out somebody's requesting? I know, Actually, thank you, but I don't know how to do it and uh, I don't want to disrupt the uh, meeting. Thank you. Okay. So, um, but so this letter was to dear, to dear Ali Baba. And then I had another letter that I found from Alada. And it mentioned, oh, yes, in this letter, Sorry. 
Oh, yes. Sorry, I missed out a bit. So she wrote to um, Alibaba and she said, oh, I must tell you, I've, I'm under house arrest. I've been grounded. I don't know why. She didn't say why. And then I found another letter from Alada, the other name, mentioning the fact that she'd been grounded. So I realized actually they were the same man and it was somebody with a nickname. So that was one example of how do you make sense of these things? And then some things happened in order or not in order. So there was a lot of finding out after, you know, I'd try one letter and then it would refer back to something I knew a little bit about from another letter. So it was a very gradual process, it took me ages. I only ever did it when the weather was bad, so it took me a long time. Yes, so what was happening? What was happening to the family and what was the context? I knew her parents were separated, but I found a date of this separation, 1933. And at that point, Mimi, my grandmother, moved with her children to Vienna. She had lived in Baden, which is a small spa town near Vienna, uh, to Leopoldstadt in, in Vienna, which you may know of. Um, very Jewish area, a mix of European Jews, some middle-class Jews lived there, Freud lived there, Schnitzler, Schoenberg. But they lived when we, we did go to Vienna and we found the area, and it was actually quite a poor area where she had lived. As you know, 1933 was the year that Hitler became Chancellor in Germany. I started reading around the period a bit. Of course, it was a tumultuous time in Austria too. And many people will know more about this than me. There were frequent violent demonstrations in Leopoldstadt against uh, Jews, including a violent attack on a cafe in 1929. And there was a huge contrast between Red Vienna and the conservative Catholic countryside. And from the 20s, Vienna developed some pretty amazing socialist policies, social housing, which I think still exists, uh, childcare, education, libraries, pensions, unemployment benefit, public swimming pools, etc. And then there was the Great Depression, um, the collapse of a major bank, and Dolphus became chancellor in 1932. He was very authoritarian. He was close to the Italian fascists, fighting on two fronts. He was fighting on two fronts. First of all, against the Nazis. He didn't want Austria to be uh, swallowed up by by Germany, um, and he was also fighting against the socialists. And I found this very interesting book by someone called Gedje. I don't know if anyone in the field has come across Gedje. Yeah. I think you know him, Charmaine, yes. And uh, he was writing, he was 10 years in Vienna from 1929, and he knew absolutely everybody. It was quite a small town. He knew diplomats, he knew washerwomen who were in the Social Democratic Party. And he writes a lot of, about what was happening there. Um, and he gives a day by day account. And his view was very much the working class fighting back against Dolphus and his oppressive actions. And he was very angry with Dolphus that he didn't ally with the trade unions and the socialists against Hitler and the Nazis. Um, and he wrote this in 1939. He came back home and spent a year writing this book, very, very detailed. And he didn't know at that point what was going to happen, but his predictions seemed to be very accurate. Dolphus dissolved the parliament in 1933, took away many workers' rights. There was a general strike, an armed attack on the workers' flats in Vienna. Many workers were killed. Some were hanged or sent to, to, to internment camps. Then Dolphus, the chancellor himself, was murdered by the Nazis. I'm saying this so you can see the background, but none of this is reflected in the letters. And that's one of the very curious things. But my grandmother, she was living in the midst of all this and she didn't mention anything about it. So most of the letters continue about the family. My mother went to England in 1936. She, um, she always said it was going to, <coughs> she came to England to learn English and to travel. She never mentioned politics either. She went under the care of a Miss Coe, who arranged for young women to become ladies' companions. And here I'm going to read a little bit from a very crumpled letter that I put together, for, written, written in pencil from her mother, who was obviously very anxious. If you should run out of money, there are nuns with armbands at the railway station who care for the young girls who are travelling alone. Don't be distressed, Mousy. I think you can stay if you can prove that you've got four pounds a month. 
If you don't like it and you're not able to find something that suits you, come straight back, of course. A thousand ki kisses, Muti. And Nolly first went to stay with a family called Bush. And soon after she joined them, um, they went to the Isle of Wight and then took her with them. And what she wrote then, uh, she wrote about riding on the beach. She wrote about going to the golf club bar. She was obviously very confident and having a great time. There's not much to do apart from that in an English seaside resort, she wrote to Ali Baba. And Mimi sent a stream of letters, oh, a stream of letters to um, her daughter. And this is one that has all the themes of all her later letters. Well, so this is from Mimi, who was in Vienna, to my mother, who was in Surrey. Well, I'm here in Budapest, and yesterday I went to see that woman. That woman was, I think, a clairvoyant. And interestingly, I found another similar story about um, Jewish family and the mother who mentioned going to talk to a clairvoyant. So I don't know if it was a trend at that time. That book was by Ruth Kluger. She said, so this is what she wrote, uh, going back to my grandmother. She said, I shouldn't ask you to come home, but you should stay in England. You'll find a good match there. And I don't know my future husband yet, but I will meet him soon. <laughs> Sally and Emmy, now I don't know if you can see this, you've got, um, they were the sisters of my grandmother. So I'm at the bottom, my brother, and then my mother, Nolly, and she's got two brothers. And then Mimi, the father, the, the, sorry, the, her mother, and Mimi and her brother and two sisters. And these two come up quite a lot, especially Emmy here. Yeah. So it's Emmy, that uh, was my mother's aunt that we're talking about. And her daughter now we're still in touch with, she lives in Israel. So she said, Vali and Emmy will have to give me money while I can't provide for myself. You'll marry earlier than me. And now the important thing, the prayer. We're not saying it the right way. It has to be said outside or by an open window where you can see the sky. You will marry an Englishman. I'm very curious. Everything would be wonderful except for us not being together. So the themes, the clairvoyant, the prayer, plans for, for Nolly to get a husband and for herself to find a husband, her dependency on her sisters and their husbands. In most letters, there were many detailed questions. She often, she often wrote right soon and in detail, which is where I got the title of this book from. And this is from a letter in October 1936 about her hopes for both of them to find a husband. It would be so nice if my future husband and I, she didn't know who that was, um, could come to England for the summer and spend it with you, and you would spend the winter with us over here. And again, no mention of what else was happening in Vienna at the time. Um, she had, in Mimi, my grandmother, had a habit of bringing up professional men to talk to them. This is this letter is about one of her telephone flirts. Perhaps surprising for her to share with her daughter. This was April 37. I phoned a lawyer, an acquaintance of so-and-so, anonymously. Of course, the lawyer wanted to know who I am. He's a good flirt. He's more than 40 years old and a confirmed bachelor and very funny. He tried his hardest to find out who I am. He doesn't know anything, but please be careful that France and Emmy, that is her sister and the sister's husband, don't find out about this. He's already madly in love with me and he really wants to meet me. So already you can see some signs of an interesting approach to finding a husband. <laughs> but she was very suspicious, you get a little bit of it there. And she became ever more so, particularly about her sisters. Her, sis uh, her sister Emmy's husband, Franz, was a lawyer. And Dr. Pollack, who appears here, he was, oh, here, yes. he was an article clerk to the lawyer. And uh, he must have come to London and uh, come to England and seems to have visited Nolly. And um, her mother wrote to Nolly, never leave Dr. Pollock alone, Pollock alone in your room. And don't show him my letters at all. Lock them in your suitcase. I lock all your letters into the bookcase instantly. Number the letters. They are lawyers. So, <laughs> she was worried there might be pressure for Nolly to marry this Dr. Pollack, my brother-in-law's article clerk. If you marry Dr. P, she wrote, 
you would be completely dependent on Emmy. Emmy wants to have power over both of us. She won't get me, that's for sure. So be careful and don't, don't give in. Be very kind and say thank you. And apologies for the language. He said, she wrote, Emmy is the most cunning bitch on earth. <laughs> I was very struck by this hostility and anger at her sister. When I was a child, I met Emmy in the 50s and many times, and she was absolutely delightful and the most warm person. And it was just difficult to understand what was the source of this hatred. Um, yes. The other thing that struck me was Mimi's ability to write such pithy, expressive language. Elsewhere, she wrote, France is under Emmy's command more than ever he was before. And if Nolly married Dr. P, she wrote, you would have Emmy as a commander and Valley as a general. <laughs> this language just flowed out of her. As I say, it's all scribbled in pencil, well, or pen, but obviously written very quickly without too much thought. Uh, another place, another letter she wrote, all cats could learn from her betrayal. <laughs> a bit later she said, right soon, there's nothing but war over here. Now I don't know whether that was political strife, their mention, or whether it was war in the family. Again, about her sister, she said, she is lying like the press. Um, I'm reading this first batch of letters from the hat box. There was a question in my mind about why this extreme language. Later on, I found another batch of letters at the back of a cupboard in my mother's house. And once I followed up some of them, this question was answered. We'll come on to that. But finding out, so finding out what was happening was a gradual process with one piece of evidence clarifying something I found earlier that I couldn't understand. Um, in August 37, there's one of the very few mentions relating to the risk of people of Jewish heritage. She said, she wrote, it would be best if we became Seventh-day Adventists. If, if, we if we should become Catholics, our birth certificates would say we were Jewish. So that was one of the very few times that she mentioned anything about it. So I wondered, um, yes, yeah, so a picture of a very loving but very anxious mother. And with that exception, what struck me was she hardly ever referred to the Nazis and the threat. And I wondered if this was common among similar families in Vienna. So um, I don't know if other people, this is a book, Last Wolf in Vienna by John Clare, um, a story, very affectionate but tragic uh, family memoir. Looking back, he considered how it was that his family ignored all the signs of Nazi influence growing. In 1936, he described how life continued as usual. We were packing for the summer holidays, bad Ishkul again. So this was in 1937. And then there was a woman, a Jewish woman called Helen Hilsenrat. She owned big cinemas in Vienna and she, in 1937, went on holiday near Vienna at a resort where the Blue Danube was playing, but there was also a Nazi camp nearby. She wrote later about the deceiving serenity for yet another summer. But children uh, saw things differently. And I want to tell you, this is a book by my wonderful cousin, Ava Kolisch, who just very sadly died in her late 90s this year in New York. She was on the kinder transport and she wrote this memoir later on, obviously. Um, and she was writing about this. She was also lived in Baden, which was uh, the little town where my mother lived. Um, on whether our town in Austria was somewhat or very anti-Semitic, my family was divided. My parents hold strongly to the former opinion that it was somewhat anti-Semitic. We children were convinced of the latter. The teachers, she wrote, could be divided into four categories, nice, sadists, anti-Semitic sadists, anti-Semitic non-sadists. So the children had a different experience. Eva's parents, she wrote, were making plans to emigrate, but all the while they still had the fleeting hope that what had happened was only a passing nightmare, nightmare from which they would wake up one day, desirable Austrians once more. So I think it wasn't only my family that, and I'm sure there's a lot of other research about this, about what was going to happen. Um, 
So this is um, this is the town Baden where they lived, just an hour from Vienna. It was a little spa town, and this was a postcard which we had, and she always showed to me the um, this roof here, which was there um, where their apartment was. Um, and this was the door to that apartment, a block of flats rather, and this is the lock. And we were standing outside, I went with Zoe, my daughter was here, and um, a woman came up to us and said, uh, can I help you? And I said, oh yes, my mother's 98 or whatever she was, she used to live here. And she said, "Can um, uh, do, would you like to come in? And she took us in, it so happened that she lived in the same apartment in the block that my mother had lived in. And what I noticed was it had the same parky flooring as the house that she chose to live in, in Surrey. And the Vienna woods <laughs> were very like the Surrey Hills. So there was a, a real continuity there. This is the swimming pool in Baden, which again was a postcard that she always showed me. Um, and this is the same swimming pool. And this is one of the photographs to me, I, I really, it means a lot to me, this photograph, this kind of 30s feel. Is it just romanticism? I don't know. Um, and I really wanted to get into the um, swimming pool, but I, do you need another chair? Um, oh, there's one there, yes. Um, we went in October and they just closed the swimming pool so we couldn't actually go inside, but I spent a long time trying to look through the glass, really trying to see into the past in a way. I even went around the right, the back of the swimming pool and looked through everybody's hedges and I really wanted to see that scene there. And of course, I couldn't see it. And this is Mimi, my grandmother. And this is um, a wonderful lake in um, Hungary that um, they often used to go there. And it seemed like, um, Mimi had some money there and they used to go on holiday there. And then again, this is to me a very meaningful picture. And here's my mother on one of these holidays. And here she is with a companion. And here indeed is, uh, this is Aladar himself. Um, oh my God, this, sorry, I seem to have got a bit confused. Yeah, so that is a picture I found, and she wrote to him in a in a, another letter in a very flirty way. Um, and this is one of the letters. Sorry, these seem to be they've been transferred from keynote to PowerPoint, and somehow they seem to be slightly out of order. So sorry about that. But this is Otto, so he's the younger brother, and by this time um, he was working as a mechanic as an apprentice in Vienna. This is after, after the divorce. And there are several affectionate letters from him. In summer of 1937, he spent a lot of time in the holidays in the Baden swimming pool. And he wrote to Nolly in 1937, this was, as requested, I report about my holidays. Your wish is my command, and I like to get commands. <laughs> he went to the swimming pool. I made the acquaintance of a 20-year-old actress in a very slow but easy process. I saw a very beautiful young lady in the pool, but I wasn't much interested in her because every other one is beautiful here. Suddenly, who was sitting behind me? Just this young lady, and she observed me unobtrusively. I actually have a special sense for things like that. I observed her, but in a way that she would realise that I don't want her to realise that I observed. <laughs> a bit complicated, but women like that have worked. So gradually I'm sort of getting some sense from these tiny little bits of paper of what my family were like. And I, I must say I quite like that letter. And he sent several more joking, lovely, le lov loving letters. Um, yes. Going back to Nolly, my mother in England, as we saw, she stayed in London with her first family, the Bushes, went to the Isle of Wight with them. Um, and I found an official letter to her from the Home Office. It said that if she wanted to stay on with a family, she could get permission from the Home Office, but only if they had adequate domestic help. I suppose, again, it was about keeping British jobs for British people. She could be a lady's companion 
but for her, I, I, and I'd be interested if people know, there were obviously other people who were employed as domestics, but that is what the, they wrote to her. And then she stayed with someone called Mrs. de Grain in Surrey, who was pregnant. Mimi wrote more long letters with detailed instructions about the pregnancy <laughs> and what Mrs. de Grain needed. I, need, I just want to read you a little bit. Um, yes, this is from two pages of advice. I'm only going to read you a little bit. Above all, you must not lose your head when the pain is about to start. That is natural. Write down the phone numbers of the doctor and the midwife. Signs of labour are recognised and distinguished from other back pain through the equal interviews through which they appear. Firstly, every 15 minutes, then every 10 minutes, then every five minutes. And she said, above all, prepare her for the fact that her husband will barely show interest in the child during the first weeks, as men don't like newborn babies at all. <laughs> However, after a few weeks, when the child is a bit more grown, they can't get enough of them. All men are the same in this matter. You have to tell Mr. de Gren that he has to say that the child is beautiful and that it's wonderful to see how it develops day by day. So again, a little about her, yes. Um, after that, when Mrs. de Grin had the baby, my mother had to move on because she needed a nanny and my mother wasn't a nanny. And then she went to stay in Horsley in Surrey, near Guildford, with Ronald and, Ronald and Florence Whitting. And Ronald had a brother called Aubrey. And Aubrey and my mother then got engaged and he was actually my father. So there should be a picture. Here they are having tea. So this is my father and mother. This is in 1937. And of course, Mimi was delighted, absolutely delighted. She wrote, I don't think your choice was a bad one. A nice house, garden, car, and a chicken farm, four to five pounds a week, a good looking, kind and caring man. Nolly dear, I have several questions and ideas for you, uh, ideas for your future, and I do want answers. First of all, how is Aubrey as a person? In the photograph, he looks handsome. Do you like him? Do you get on well? Are you comfortable to be close to him, to be together with him? The money issue is important, but this is much more important. Secondly, what did Aubrey's parents die of? I'm asking because of genetic illnesses. Is Aubrey's house and farm debt free? I think, I think she got a kind of diary from, dowry from France, her uncle. I don't think you should put Francis money into a bank, but use it to start your own farm beside Aubrey's farm. She sent very detailed plans for decorating and furnishing. If you have the book, you will read. It's very detailed and quite interesting. And she also had a vision of Nolly's future, some of which came to pass. She suggested that they could have young women or men who wanted to learn English to stay. How far away are you from the sea? You'll see how much fun it would be to have girls around the house. You could play bridge, tennis, read, go to London together. You could plant fruit trees, which she did. She sent worked out plans for her daughter to keep pigs with details of costs and profit, really detailed plans of how many, how much it would cost, how many pig houses to have, how many pigs in the house, very detailed. And again, they did, during the war, my parents did keep pigs, and not when I was alive, but um, yes, so I remember that. So it was very strange to read these things that I saw coming to pass. They also had young people from Europe coming to, to learn English who helped on the farm, some young men who helped on the farm. Um, yes, so she, and then she had other plans and advice for Nolly. Even as a married woman, you can upgrade your education, listen to lectures, do sports, take Aubrey with you, draw out his interest, read good books during the winter, <laughs> and talk about the content with him. And then she said, you'll have to tell Emmy, the sister that she couldn't bear, about your engagement, but don't invite her, definitely not, because she would certainly come over. And where she goes, no grass will grow. <laughs> um, Otto also wrote to her, his sister about her engagement. Above all, I do congratulate you sincerely, and I hope it's no false alarm. Please send me a portrait of yourself and Aubrey, or Aubrey. When I received your letter at our workshop, I thought to myself, oh dear, what must have happened that my sister sends a letter to this address and not home? My colleague said, maybe she's given birth and doesn't dare to write this. For a moment, I had a vision of a tiny Nolly or 
Otto. So that was a little bit about Otto. So then we get to 1938, and it was a year of huge contrast for my family. Nolly was engaged, her mother was thrilled, such security, a small house, a field. Um, but in Austria, of course, there was terrible anxiety. Um, in March 38, as I'm sure everybody knows, Hitler wanted to take over Austria. Um, Schussnig, the chancellor after Dolphus was assassinated, he called a plebiscite on whether Austria should be absorbed into Germany. However, before that happened, it was canceled and the Nazis invaded. And I don't know, on the 14th of March, there was a huge welcome for Hitler into Vienna. And I don't know if you've seen some of those shocking films of masses and masses of Viennese people welcoming him. It's very gruesome to watch. Um, and on the 22nd of March in Britain, the House of Commons voted against a bill to make it easier to admit Austrian refugees more easily. The same hostile environment as we've got today. It's become clear that the UK's reputation for generosity refugees was certainly not true. And there's a recent book about the kinder transport, um, what really happened, which shows this as well by Andrea Hamill. So a year of contrast, France still in Austria, this is in January 38, he sent just the names and addresses of three women, what their skills were with their addresses. He didn't say anything else, but presumably that was to, for my mother to look for work for them in England. He wrote, I'm still trembling. I had this unfortunate feeling already in Vienna in 1937. Hopefully the next year and the following year won't be worse. It's too sad. Friedel Goldschmidt died in Buchenwald concentration camp from a lung infection. Those beasts kept preventing the dying man from sending or getting any letters. So that was the Viennese situation. Then it appeared that Mimi was going to come to England. No definite information about it, but there's one letter and it says the time, 9.30 p.m. outside the post office in Vienna, no date. Uh, so Otto wrote to his sister, be aware and only do what I'm writing here. I'll keep it short. You called France because you're worried about Mutti. She's not in danger. She only wants to be out of this atmosphere. Send Mutti 700 shillings in the shortest possible time. The clairvoyant is to blame for all of this. So something was happening, but I don't know what it was. I've just got that letter. This is what's interesting about this process. There's lots of things I don't know. But the wedding was planned and there was a letter from my father, Aubrey, um, to his mother-in-law-to-be saying, um, inviting her to give my mother away in the wedding. And he, the main issue was that it was a bad time of year to travel. If she was going to travel, they got married on the 4th of April. So it was, that was the only issue. This is, as I say, this is in 1938. And he made a little joke. He said, he hopes her English would be good enough so that when the vicar says, who's giving this woman away, Nolly doesn't have to tread on your toes for you to say, I do. <laughs> so this was the tone of the letter. And would Mimi mind staying in their house while they went on a four day honeymoon to Lyme Regis? So he seemed to not know anything about what was going on in Vienna at all. So then we get on to, this is the wedding in Hornsley. Um, <clears throat> Yes, but at the same time as this was happening, this was just a month after Hitler invaded. My cousin, who, as I say, later was in the, in the transport, she wrote about this time in her memoir. Her mother was summoned to scrub the floor of the synagogue before it would be turned into a stable for horses. So this is all happening, yes. And France wrote, my mother's uncle, for her wedding, you're a dear, brave girl. I do think of you, and I'm happy that you found a pathway to a blessed fortune. Otto and Hans are doing well, so he didn't mention at that point his own problems there. So what happened to Minnie? She came for the wedding. I know that because there is a card for her from Lyme Regis where they went for their honeymoon. And what happened next? 
And I am aware that I only know what was written down, what happened to survive. A friend of Stefan Zweig wrote, how arbitrary and selective the history is that is in the end preserved. So I don't know what happened for a little while, but by July, Mimi seemed to be in London. She had been staying with them in Surrey. No, one, no other information as how she was living there, but there was a letter from Otto in Vienna to his mother. And he said, no one is reproaching you for your illness. You have to make sure not to let it get to you. He writes that he's trying to get a visa from the Home Office, but that women are 90% more likely to get one <coughs> to get into the UK. What else did I know about them? From my memory, I just remember my mother said she could remember. Yeah, I told you she couldn't remember where her mother was buried. She told me once about taking my brother, two years older than me, to see her mother. She couldn't go into a room with a baby as her mother had cancer. That would have been in 1943. But I didn't have any further records there about what happened. But what I did was I got her medical records through her birth, um, her birth, um, through her birth date. And they came in this great big envelope and they're very, very sad. She had she spent her time in the 40s in two hospitals in Surrey, both of them mental hospitals. She heard voices, she'd taken poison once she tried to get out of a moving car. Uh, maybe her early extreme suspiciousness and her hostility to her sister was related to this mental distress. There were lots of notes while she was in the hospital, both hospitals, from my mother asking permission to visit. She was given ECT and then a leukotomy. And there's a very sad note. So in the left, in the, all the, there's really detailed medical notes and the doctor wrote leukotomy, total failure. So that was very sad. Then she got cancer. I was five on holiday in the Isle of Wight. This is 1949. And in the, in the hospital notes, there's information on how to contact my mother. It could be at nine o'clock in the morning, one o'clock lunchtime, 6.30 p.m. And then I had a vague memory. We probably stayed in a boarding house. And if anyone's old enough to remember, you had to leave the boarding house after breakfast. So that was yes and yes. Um, and then she died on the 3rd of September. Mimi died 3rd of September, 1949. The death certificate says cancer. Um, I was five. It was never mentioned in my childhood. So this was some of the sad things that I found out. I also found um, a diary, and this was from much earlier on, and it was written in old German. I had to get my German friends to get one of their mothers to translate it and then into English. Um, lots, she was 13, this is Mimi, my grandmother. She was 13, lots of description about a tennis tournament and a way of writing, and she still, she already had this way of writing, age 13, that was fluent and pithy. For example, she was writing about a woman that she met on holiday. This woman had two fairly intelligent daughters, which is surprising, given the fact that she's their mother. <laughs> I've been struck by her trenchant language, as I said. She wrote about a suitor with a parchment complexion. And I've told her, she said, all cats can learn from her sister's betrayal. And where she goes, the grass won't grow. <laughs> what happened to her brother Otto? Neither he nor her, his older brother Hans were mentioned in my childhood. I wondered if they had died in a camp. I did find sketches and paintings that I thought were Otto's because he came to England. Yes, I'll tell you a bit more about what happened, but he did go to an art school in the evening and there's some rather beautiful paintings by him. Um, oh yes, this is something else about them in 38. Franz wrote to Molly, he'd heard that Otto had left for England. In November 38, there was the terrible night Kristallnacht in Germany and Austria, which was a violent attack on Jewish homes and synagogues. But he seems to have left just in time before then. Then I got a bit more information from a letter from France in 39. He, by then, with his wife, Emmy, my mother's, uh, my, 
yes, my grandmother's sister, he got to Palestine, 39, and he mentioned that Otto had been with a company in London called Masterman Smith, and then he seemed to have moved around different addresses and worked as a mechanic. And as I say, there's quite a lot in the letters um, about him going to art college, which he obviously was passionate about. Then unexpectedly, I found this notebook, yeah, this red notebook, and it had been forever in my mother's magazine rack, and I'd never found it. I just went and found it one day, and I was amazed because um, it said it's it's psychology at one side and engineering science at the other side. So that side psychology notes very well written in English, and this and it's dated Morley College, nineteen. 47. So he did survive. And that's the only, well, information I had about that. Later on, a cousin came from Melbourne. She knew about the Dunera, which was a terrible ship that was used to deport so-called enemy aliens to Australia. And some people will know that from the 3rd of September 39, when war was declared, Austrians and Germans in Britain were declared enemy aliens. People feared they'd help the Nazis. Initially, they were divided into three categories according to their perceived risk. And there were different stages, but the lists were inaccurate. So people who had lived in England for years or new refugees or some Nazis were all arrested and either interned or deported to Australia and Canada. And you probably know about the Arandora Star, which was a ship that went to Canada, was torpedoed, full of internees, mostly Italian. It was torpedoed and it sank and 800 people died. Um, Otto wasn't on that, but he was on this other ship, the notorious Dunera, extremely bad treatment on board. And then he was sent to a camp near Melbourne. And there's quite a lot of detail in the book about this. I'm really summarizing enormously. Um, he was first sent first to one camp and then another. And he participated in some of the classes that were organized and that made a huge impression on him. And later on, he wrote about, he wanted to be, he wanted to have access to all that knowledge. He said it was like a medicine bottle out of reach. He was very envious of some people he met from Cambridge on the boat on the river. And he was, it was medicine that was just out of reach for him. And this is one of his paintings. What happened to him? I sent off his death certificate and it showed another tragedy. He jumped to his death from a railway bridge in Surrey near the hospital where his mother was. I think he'd been visiting her and the details are in the book. It's a huge sadness. I found a document, this is about um, suicide of refugees in the Wiener Library around the corner and used press reports in England lists 12 Jews, Austrian and German. This is in a very short period, first to the 16th of July, 1940. Some were awaiting internment and 12, these 12 named people committed suicide just in that very short two weeks. And the government is still promoting a hostile environment and these things are still happening. In the book, I tell what happened to Edmund Nolly's father and to Hans. He did get Hans Scott to Palestine, to an agricultural settlement that was set up after the forced expulsion of Palestinians from their village. It was called Fajr by settlers. And as we know, this all is tragically continuing um, in the worst possible way. In 1957, I was 13, there was a letter from another cousin in Israel to my mother. He said, Hans is in a residential place in Israel. And as I say, I was 13 then, he was never mentioned. And I haven't managed to find out anything else about him. So that's all I'm gonna say about the story that's written in much more detail with many more pictures in, in the book. But um, should I have kept the letters and put them together? And that was an issue. And there were various family rumors about Otto. I asked my dear cousin Eva, the one who'd been on the kinder transport, what, if she knew anything about Otto. She replied, I don't know all the suffering Mimi, Mimi's family went through over Otto's death and why your mother couldn't talk about it. I remember only that my mother told me it had been a suicide. A few minutes later, she sent another email. Dearest Marion, 
Please forgive my pre previous letter. It was wrong of me to tell you not to check out your mother's past in relation to her brother or anything else. Implied was, she's an old lady, she's wonderful, leave her alone. Or she's an old lady, no matter what she might have done or suppressed about her past or tried not to know or talk about, she's a wonderful woman, leave her alone and forgive her. I responded that way because I was identifying only with her, not with you. But now I remember, this is in Eva's letter, that she never told you anything about her Austrian past. She seemed all too glad to discard it and slip into her Austrian identity. Undoubtedly, she had her own, <coughs> own reasons for wanting to cut herself off from the Austrian past and start anew. But that wasn't good for the child. The child needs to know who her parent was in order to understand who her parent is. So what are the issues? I mean, one of, for me, one is whose view on what material should survive and be, be available. And the other is about um, how people can be recreated re in a way. I knew nothing about my grandmother except her name and how come from these delicate shreds she now has to me a personality, a strong character, and that I feel I have a relationship with her and with her son Otto, sadly not with Hans. And then photographs, what is the, what is the importance of the photographs? Annette Kuhn wrote, a photograph seizing of a moment always, always, even at that very moment, anticipates, assumes loss. So, I'm just going to hand this now over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Marianne. I'm sure that many people here will identify with your Sherlock Holmes process <laughs> and suffer from the disappointments, but be elated by the successes in what you've found. May I start the questioning um, first of all? How did you feel after you'd achieved all this and found all this information? Was it cathartic or has it left you feeling, I want to know more? Um, I never told my mother, she was still alive when I started this book, this work. I didn't know it was going to be a book. I never told her because she had made it very clear she didn't want to dig it all up again. And I still don't know. I mean, if she knew this was happening, um, I think she would have been delighted. So that's a bit sad. But at the same time, I think I did make the right decision because she didn't want to dig it all up. It's difficult to know. Yeah. What I feel about doing the book, well, I'm very pleased. I mean, there was masses of material and we've probably, all of us got, older people have got loads of archives and I'm very pleased that the mass of archives are all in one book. I, that, I'm very satisfied with that. But of course, there's still many questions, but I don't know that I'm going to do any more exploration of this. I'm reading a little bit more about Austria in the 30s, but yes. So I'm pleased I created it as something which is yes, a wide ranging. Yes, yes. Discoveries. Mm. Uh, do we have any questions, please, from the floor? Everyone's digesting or, and thinking over what you've said. Did you investigate and try and find out whether um, the ignorance or the the, the not taking any notice of the political background was to a particular class, particular families, particular sex, particular what? I mean, uh, it seems as though... Well, I think there's some people here who know much more about this than I okay, do. that would be interesting. I don't know if other people want to comment on that. I mean, I, I just did a tiny bit of investigation through other memoirs, very, very, and I did find that they didn't want to... Well, they hardly mentioned it. If they did, um, in fact, this guy, George Clare, his father at one point said, I think we should leave Austria. 
but then he put it aside. He didn't want to give up his job. He didn't want that terrible, huge disruption. So I think that happened, you know, that people knew about it. But I don't know. I don't know whether other people who know more. Oh, you can answer this, I'm sure. Um, I didn't get the question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, that is now. I was wondering if there was any, the, the, the lack of knowledge of the political background right. seems willful, uh, almost. I don't think I, but, kind of, uh, no, I'm not, I don't so I'm not being rude about it. I'm just, I'm just, no, no, I'm just wondering, wondering who, I'm just wondering where, where it comes from. What, was it any particular group of people or whatever? Um, I think it was, it was quite general. I think people, in, I mean, my parents both came from the uh, uh, I was also born in 1944, um, <laughs> uh, and I've done quite a lot of work on um, on refugees specifically from Austria. Um, but my parents were also completely taken by surprise by the Anschluss, by the annexation of Austria, um, because they uh, the, the general belief seems to have been that. Um, uh, the Nazis would be would hold back from invading Austria. For a start, um, previously when Hitler had threatened Austria at the time of Dolphus' assassination in 1934, Mussolini had sent troops to the uh, Austrian border as a sign of support. Um, and Hitler had uh, the assassination had no further effects. Um, I think it was it was general that that, that people did not um, actually expect the Anschluss, um, although there was, as you pointed out, high levels of anti-Semitism. Um, that that's, that is my um, opinion. I was going to, if I may, make one further point um, on a different different point. That is the question of the number of Austrians. The Austrian Jews that were admitted into Britain. Now, figures compiled by the Israeli Jakutas Commander, which is the representative body of the Jews in Vienna, and they compiled figures after the war for the Allied Occupation Authorities, uh, which state that uh, there are about 200,000, just under 200,000 Jews in Austria. Just over 30,000 came to this country more than anywhere else. As the first country of the more slightly more than in the United States, so that change with uh, re migration during the month of the And that, of course, took place within the, the 18 months between March 1938 and September 1939. Uh, so uh, I'm something of a lone voice amongst academics in defense of the British government. I don't believe there was that much of a hostile um, environment towards Jewish refugees in that particular period. Um, the British, well, I'm not saying they were overly welcoming either, but uh, my father, who came here as a refugee in Switzerland, I'm sure, so managed to get 11 people out. And I grew up in, in a, a, a large community of refugees in northwest London. So I, I, I just want to say that in, in defense of the then British government, I think my parents were actually jolly lucky to come under Neville Chamberlain and Home Secretary Samuel Hall, and not under the present government. <laughs> <laughs> Surely, during the Second World War, weren't there quite a lot of uh, Jewish people from Austria and other countries who were locked up in, yes. in the Isle of Wight, I think Absolutely. it was? Or was Man. It? Isle of Man. Isle of Man, sorry. Mm. Uh, I mean, my grandfather, they knocked at my grandfather's door one day and, and just took him away and locked him up. Yes. So I'm not sure whether that's quite consistent with it. Oh, yeah, it's entirely true. But this has nothing to do with the admission of refugees, mm. as Mary McAlpine pointed out. This was a panic reaction to the, um, the occupation of France and the Low Countries by, um, by the Nazis. There was a panic um, 
churches, those who issued the rule were saying call them along yeah. because of course they couldn't tell who was a who, who, who was a genuinely Jewish refugee. But in fact, they were hardly even spies and John and Prince was discovered much more than I put that on. And then, then, then certainly, yes, then that, that, that was that also occurred. And these are two sides or different sides of one story. But it's, of it course, not an open door policy. Certainly um, not. No, 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 I mean, my father, my, my parents came, um, and my mother came, you know, it's it quite Could common. you speak up, please? Sorry, I'm talking this way. <laughs> my mother Sorry, came. My mother came um, as a domestic, which was one of the ways that you could do it. But if you were a man, it was different. And my father had much more trouble, and he had to find a guarantor, a financial guarantor. And this is not from Austria, but um, it certainly. I mean, I mean, that's just my family. But you know, it certainly was not an open door policy as the months went by. Um, possibly in that early earlier phase, it was easier, but it got more difficult. But this was speaking of two different periods. Yes. Eighteen months before the war. I mean, this is this is simple fact. In the first six years before and after the Nazi takeover of power, the fact that they were in the first year, comparatively two people in the last eighteen months before sixty thousand from Germany and Austria. Uh, of course, you can't really be after that because it's in front of the family. So, that anyway, I think that's one of the nice things. And, and there are two so different periods because the internment didn't start taking place until after war was declared. So, there are two different experiences in mm -hmm. that regard due to the different periods in time mm -hmm. and different experiences also because it depended on. As so many people here know already, um, where they were interned. I mean, for people interned on the Isle of Man, they felt like sitting ducks it had Hitler invaded, had he been able to and succeeded. So that was quite different from someone perhaps being in a prison um, or being released. It and sent somewhere else, but just to be a sitting duck must have or felt like a sitting duck must have been absolutely horrendous. Mm -hmm. It was also very difficult for people coming from Eastern Europe and um, from Poland <coughs> and from Austria to get into Britain in the, in the 30s. I mean, that's partly why there was so much migration to Palestine in the 30s and led to the Arab revolt, which then put pressure on the British that they couldn't they that they couldn't just carry on allowing they in fact they stopped allowing the level of migration into Palestine. And all my family went in the thirties went to the ones that got out went to Palestine. Um, and that, that was that was no longer possible because of the Arab revolt from 36 to 39. So that's why I think you get you get a shift, a very reluctant shift, although it may well have been also linked to class. And I think this is very linked to class that Austrian Jews, I think, and it was a, a class who lived in a bubble, really, in terms of, and the same in Germany, that not believing that they could be tough, that it would affect them. Mm -hmm. But I do think it is, it's nevertheless it, quite extraordinary the degree to which it doesn't filter in in any way. Um, you know, and it sort of, sort of carries on the, the cultural pastimes and you know, finding a husband and so all of this just carries on blithely as mm -hmm. though the world isn't being turned upside down. Mm, absolutely, yes, I was really struck by that. I did try at one point to look at the dates, what was happening in Leopoldstadt, where my grandmother, when she was divorced, lived, what was happening on the street and what was happening to her moods, you know, when she was mm. particularly aggressive about, you know, was it a reflection? I couldn't actually see, I didn't, I wasn't successful in seeing any 
kind of correlation, but I did that did occur to me actually that it was kind of mis displaced from her anxiety into the family strife. Mm. I don't know, but it is it was very surprising. I found, yeah. Over how long uh, were you? Or, you know, what sort of period were you actually researching and? Getting your shreds. Oh, right. Information well, I probably together. left it for about three or four years. And then I, you know, I left it on the shelf. And then I, maybe I was retired, I think, then. And I started, I think, several years. because, But I only did it, as I say, when the weather wasn't good. Because I felt <laughs> like being active. So maybe seven or eight or nine years. So we do something like while. that. Yes. So, and, yeah. and have you found that there's more information available now? Um, for example... The National Archives in Kew releases fresh documents. I haven't each followed year. that up. I could do. It's worthwhile. Yes, yes, I yes. should do that. Yes, yes. There was a question online. Yes. Yes. Somebody wanted to know if you'd said that Otto studied at M. I don't know what M. Morley oh. College. Morley College. Oh. I, that was what the question was that was being asked. Oh, right? thank you. Thank you. Lisa. Well, I can say something about that. I did yes. write because he did study at Morley College and I've been there. I was there. A number as a, of refugees studied there. Right. Yes. I did write to them and um, ask them if they had any records, but they only keep them for seven years. So I was very disappointed. I have but, also in the past uh, and I couldn't have access uh, to right. them, unfortunately, yes. because that would have been really interesting. Oh, yes. Yes. yes, a whole topic on its own. Yes. Yeah. No, I was very disappointed. Mm, mm. Mm. That's, what, win that's what archives are for, isn't it? So that people can come back and look at them after yeah. more than seven years. Yes. No, I think that they've really <laughs> done it us a disfavour there. Yes, yes. No disrespect to the college, but uh, mm. and I know people can't keep things forever always, well, and storage is a problem, but... Um, so many refugees did study there. Oh, wait, I didn't know that. Mm. I didn't know that. Very interesting. Mm. Can yes. I ask you about, you mentioned your cousin who was on the kinder transport. And I mean, did you know her when you were a child or is that a link that you've made? No, I, I was probably grown up when I first got to know her and realised that we had a lot in common. And, um, and then I went to see her and yes, and I kept going to see her all my life really. And so he's been to see her too. And so, so at that point, you're, you're, the Jewish bit of your family was? Yes, she, she, didn't, she didn't particularly want to talk about it. You know, she had, I, I remember being struck, we went somewhere on a train and she was really anxious getting this train. And I suddenly put two and two together and thought, ah, train. Mm, um, connotations. Yes, yes. Mm. And I didn't really, want, I mean, we had so many other things to talk. I didn't actually talk to her a lot about, she said a little bit, but it was like she dealt with that. She wrote this memoir and then another fictionalised one, which were lovely. And But she was also very, she was very much an activist and had a lot of other things happening in her life. So I didn't, I, I, we were very fond of each other, as you can tell. <laughs> Did you know that you were Jewish from childhood? No, no, no. I was never, no, my mother never talked anything about being Jewish at all. No, mm. not at all. And my father was English mm. and not religious at all. Mm. Or, you know, he was an English little farmer. Your question. So, the question up there. Did oh. you mention which classes he, I don't know how Talk. you can get them back. Did you mention which classes? I'm, I'm assuming it's referring back to Otto. I'm wondering whether you knew what classes he took. Um, I have got this book, and he did take, yes, he took psychology, and there's a long essay I found about memory, which is really <laughs> fascinating. It's all in this beautiful English. Amazing. <laughs> I have unmuted myself. Sorry, I'm here. I'm here on Zoom. That was an absolutely wonderful presentation, Marion. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm just very interested. I'm um, currently doing some research into emigres and Morley College. So oh. it just was very serendipitous um, to, to hear of someone, you know, with that, this personal recollection. And on Zoom, I couldn't actually see the red notebook. Um, oh. is, Can you see it now? Well, no, no, obviously it comes up on the screen as you know, it's tiny, 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 but um, I'd love to know more about it. Is there some way I can email you? Of course, yes. 
Justification. Okay. Is it Diane Shelley spe speaking? No. No, who's speaking, please? It's Rachel. Yana, it's Rachel. Oh, Rachel, my goodness. Hello. Hello. Rachel. Oh, so you can't see me, can you? I'm, yes. No, I'm afraid, but that's great. At the end, Rachel, sorry, Rachel is a member of the committee, we know. Um, Rachel, at the end, I'll ask Marion to give out her email address. We've discussed this already, haven't we? So it, you'll get it, or I can give it to Lovely. you if Marion doesn't mind. Thank you Thank very you so much. much. I'm very sorry happy. we can't see you. I'll go back on mute. <laughs> no, but I, I would you. love to know more about the Morley College connection. So let's get in touch, definitely. There was a question from Aileen which disappeared. Oh, what a shame. It said, and I, I can't it said it could be apparent silence about it. <laughs> Sorry, I just didn't mean this. I just mean really off the it's screen. Uh, it could be apparent silence about the letters from Austria. And then I couldn't read. I, 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 I oh, think it, 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 yeah. it went off in dot, dot, dot. So no. I don't know what it was about. I don't know how we can get around this, but I'll, I'll find out. Unmute yeah. herself. Can, um, can Hello, and hello, Marion. Hello, hello. What it says is, could the apparent silence about politics in the letters from Austria be about censorship or self-censorship or the fear of censorship? Also in those days, there was a really strong culture of um, of being strong and not talking to children. And maybe, maybe your relations stopped themselves from mentioning the terrible things that were happening so as not to worry young people. You know, they just tried to make it all seem happy and lighthearted. And actually, of course, it wasn't. I mean, other people will know more about the influence of censorship, but certainly that wasn't. I mean, Mimi seemed to just pour out her heart to her daughter. So I'm, I may have been true of other people, but I think she didn't seem to have any self-censorship, actually. You know, she wrote all about her telephone flirts and her hopes <laughs> and all of that. So... I didn't get that feeling, but I don't know, and it may well have been affected. Does anyone else? Know <laughs> yes, I can. I can vouch for that. People I've interviewed have at times said that, um, as children, of course, at that time, their parents didn't tell them. They didn't know unless they happened to be in an area where there were atrocities in Vienna or somewhere else. They did not know what was really happening, and. Of course, there was no television in those days. So if they didn't hear it on the radio, and their parents didn't tell them, they were trying, a number of interviewees had said that their parents tried hard to protect them from the harsh realities of what was happening. Older children did get to know. Uh, they may not have understood the politics behind the situations, but they were well aware. And in the schools, when they were ostracized or banned from attending school, mm -hmm. they got to realize that mm -hmm. nasty things were happening. Mm -hmm. And worse was to come, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just to follow up what Aileen was saying, I thought the letter that you read out from Otto with the instructions. Yeah. Uh, that, that felt to me like somebody who was who was being very careful about what he said. And, and so maybe, yes. I mean, whether Mimi was, I mean, she might have thought the, the censors don't mind about a bit of flirtation. <laughs> um, but, but also maybe her mind was on, on, was on other things. But he, he, that letter does sound quite restrained, doesn't it? And, it does, although it might have been about her mental health. Yes. yes. It's, we don't yeah. know really, yes. Oh, it could have been, yes, absolutely. Is there anyone who would, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was amazed reading the book that we got to page a hundred, over 100 before there was any mention at all about the rise of fascism, apart from tiny little hints about Otto being unable to represent the apprentices where he worked because of his religion um, and jokes about people's noses. Mm. I didn't know if that was about Jews, but then... Uh, Mimi does, she does talk about these things you mentioned about um, registering them as Seventh-day Adventists rather than Catholics. Mm. And that's a deliberate strategy to avoid not being identified as Jewish. So mm. she doesn't self-censor. <coughs> and then 
she talks on page 108 about registering all the family with the Fatherland Front, mm. which is the political mm. organization of Austrofascism. Mm. So she's she's doing what she thinks she should do to conform. Mm. Yeah. As the sense yeah. I've got. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. is a very conformist type person mm. and wants to be, you know, didn't apologize for that or saying she felt any angst about it. Mm. Mm. It was just, oh, I've just registered you all as for the Fatherland Front. And um and then it goes on with the rest about getting married and, and yes. you know. Yes. So I found it quite a, a frustrating read for the first 100 pages because I was looking for more and I this dreadful mother-in-law, mother, <laughs> controlling her daughter to every move with these instructions infuriated me. And I thought, poor Mo Nolly, you know, but she didn't seem to fight back or resent it. She no. didn't say piss off mother ever, like younger daughters normally would. So, I mean, it's, you know, quite a startling um, family dynamic. <laughs> yes. Is there anyone here or indeed watching through Zoom who would like to contribute about perhaps some difficulties of researching family histories? It's all right. We'll retrieve it later. Um, or, or some of the particular positive ways in which people have researched um, and would like to share this. I've got a sister who has done a lot of historical research about our family um, after my mother died. And she read all, they lived in, they were missionaries in India. And my sister was had a very difficult relationship with my mother as a result of reading all these letters from India because there was no phoning. And, you know, um, she ended up loving my mother much more than she did. <laughs> and I was infuriated with this. I thought, if only you'd spent more time with her and doing that kind of thing and reminiscing with her when she was alive, then she spent about eight years doing it. And then she kind of wrote books like this. And I thought, what a wasted opportunity. Seize the moment when people are alive. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So I've sheared away from all that stuff. And <laughs> I don't want to go. I want to live in the moment. And I want to make the most of all my relatives while they're alive. And But I don't have those big gaps. So I don't know what I would have done. Yeah. And... I don't think you should, I think you should feel positive about what you did in terms of um, trying to find out the truth. Yeah, I mean, we your, did make loads of effort mm -hmm. while she was alive to talk mm -hmm. to her about it. Which one, I, I remember one evening, so we went down to visit her, and Zoe was actually doing something in A level history about the Anschluss, weren't you? And um, we actually took the tape recorder because there was a cousin there who actually talked a lot more about what happened to her from Austria. She was staying with her. And it was a lovely summer evening. And Zoe and I were trying to steer the conversation with the cousin <laughs> around to what had happened to them both. And they absolutely, at that time, it was a beautiful evening. My mother had her favorite people around her. We were having supper on the terrace. Why would she want to talk about that? She, we made so many efforts, many times, actually. Yeah. And then there was the kind of self thing, you know, that sometimes I forgot, I meant, so next time I must ask her this. And then I forgot, which I think is, a, you know, some deeper thing. But we did actually make many attempts to try and find out more. And she definitely didn't want to talk about yeah. it. Yeah, she didn't. I asked her about her brother, about Hans, and she didn't. She, I remember exactly where I was sitting with her, and she just didn't want to say anything. She she kind of said a little bit that she had to go to school with him in Baden. So that was when you, when we were just about to leave Baden, and my mum ran off the other side of the village to take a picture of the primary school that she went to with her brother, which I think might have been a boys' school. Yeah, and it was that she didn't you know she didn't quite explain why she had to go to a boys school mm -hmm. but she mm -hmm. could sort of talk about that because it wasn't <coughs> you know, she just said she had to go to school with him because there was something wrong with him and she chose what she wanted to say mm -hmm. Caroline you knew her didn't you and she didn't tell you very no, you knew her quite well didn't you yes I asked her too much and yeah I didn't really ask her very much but if I did ask her anything, she would say a tiny bit, but then she said, Fatty, it's, it's finished, you know, it's gone. 
my Sorry. mother tried to talk to your mother a lot, but and my mother, she guessed a lot of the things that you're you're saying now, but she always blanked it or changed the subject. And and my family always talked about it and thought, you know, there was there was a big story here which we now know about. <laughs> but, but you didn't think talk about it much. I'm interested you say you did later on, but yes. when we were young, I don't think you did. No, I didn't. No, no, no. no. It was just normal, you know, it didn't yeah. strike me. No. No, this so. is how it was. She came from Austria. Whereas That's my it. parents were always talking about it. Parents, mum. <laughs> What's her story? She has a story. She must be Jewish, because of the time. Mm. Um, and Mar- of- oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was, sorry. No, I finished. I was just going to say, Marietta, um, my grand's cousin, we asked her, and again, I can remember exactly where we were when I asked her, and I was kind of saying, what happened to my, my grand's mum? Um, your gran, Mimi, and she just didn't want to say. And she said, "You have to ask your gran. You have to mm-hmm. ask your gran." So it was like she didn't want to tell my gran's story. You know, she very much felt like it would have been the way she said it was it, like it would have been a betrayal. And there was something to tell that she didn't want to, and mm-hmm. there was sort of shame around it. Mm-hmm. Do you she, think it was a mental illness, shame, or do you think it was to do with Jewishness? I mean, I, I think they're different things because yeah. there's one. There's what you're partly talking about is is people who who you're talking about who denied their Jewishness as a way of either coping or assimilating in, in a new society so that they felt safe. But there's another kind of um, there's also the silence from trauma. Like my grand, I mean, I did. I was lucky in that I. Um, did oral history with my my mother and my great aunt, my and my aunt, who was the eldest in the family. Um, but after my grandmother had died, <clears throat> and I uncovered from that, my gran was very forthright and very had a wonderful sense of humour and wisdom. And I only found out after she died. That, and she'd never talked to us. She didn't talk to her own children about it. But my mother remembered. Um, my, 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 my aunt told me that um, uh, about the family that we knew were murdered in Poland. Um, all we knew was that, that, that Gran had family that had, were murdered. Um, but I didn't know the details until I did that oral history research and... And Esther, who was the name of the eldest daughter of my grandmother's brother and his family, his, his eldest daughter, so her granddaughter in uh, her, her sorry her niece in Poland was also called Esther. They called the first the eldest daughter in mm-hmm. Esther. And um, when the Nazis came, the whole family were taken away. But Esther wasn't at home, and. Um, we, when they came, <clears throat> the partisans came and saved her and took her into the forest and she fought with the partisans for, for the next two years and it was very, very sad because um, she went into the, she, she left the forest three days before the Russians came, of course not knowing they came and liberated them. And she uh, said she couldn't bear it anymore. She had to go and look for her fiancé, and she was never seen again. Mm. But we know the story because she told she was in the forest with her best friend, and she said to her best friend, if she didn't make it, to get the to go to London and tell her aunt what had happened to her and to the whole family. Um, she didn't know the whole family had been taken and was shot. And uh, my mum remembered the best friend coming to London and coming to tea and finding my gran, uh, my mum's mum. <clears throat> and she, she sat and told her, and she said that gran afterwards locked herself in a room cried and mourned 
I never talked about it again. Mm. Now, my, that was not my, my grandmother was the most positive life force, but she couldn't obviously deal with it. And I think that experience is quite common. Mm. And, and there's the whole question, what do you do with that? Do you follow the science? But I think there is, a, it is incumbent on the, the subsequent generation of people who've done oral history research to try and piece together those histories because otherwise they, they are, they're lost forever. And I, I think that that's a different kind of um, silence. And, and I've also, my own mum was in a Hasidic Jewish home in State Newington and I met Auschwitz survivors in there. <clears throat> and they're very interesting how different they are yeah. in their yeah. response. Um, some are very, all very severely injured physically, but also um, some spiteful, nasty, turned out she was a Mengele experiment. <laughs> I just thought she was a horrible person because she picked on my mum, among others. But w when I went to complain about it, that's what I and then others who there was a very and she was Austrian. There was a very petite woman who said, um, who, who got to talk to us in the garden, mm. and she said she had told her children about her experience, but she said she couldn't talk about it again, and she admired people who worked with the Holocaust Education Trust. That she couldn't do that. So I think there's, and I think that's quite typical of it. It's a very different array of, of people. Yes, in, in interviews, it's very noticeable. Uh, for example, the AJR Refugee Voices Project, it's very noticeable that people tend to either be people who spoke about their experiences or those who definitely didn't want to, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. if an, uh, an interview were, were arranged. Oh, I can't remember. Uh, no, no, evasive mm -hmm. answers. Mm -hmm. And some people, of course, felt guilty about surviving mm -hmm. when members of their family didn't. And how does one cope with that? Mm -hmm. That's extremely hard. One's life continues and the children as well. Uh, I've, I've met Czech uh, Jewish people commemorating their lives and not wishing to have what they called the sort of atomic shadow and cloud uh, hovering over their own children. So they made a real effort to be terribly positive and see both sides of a situation and naturally feeling unhappy about the loss of their family members, but being positive that they were alive, that their children were alive, and to move forward. But that's not easy to do, and people react in different ways. Even I've interviewed twins, for example, and it was very interesting to see whether they responded in a similar way, I mean, not necessarily identically, but in a very similar way or in an opposite way. As it turned out, it was a similar way and they even studied similar topics. But you no, know, it, it's not easy. In Poland especially had such a high percentage of Jewish people. I think it was the highest percentage in um, Central and, West, and Western Europe. Um, I just think that, you know, we are looking at things through the prism of how we see the world today. There's been a sort of big explosion of interest in, in recent years. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I remember how it was, you know, um, 40 years ago or whatever, um, I mean, it, it just was so different. You know, I mean, the people who'd come here and had those experiences... Obviously, not everybody was the same, but, you know, certainly in my family, um, people were focused on wanting to make new lives. And I think also there's that element of 
wanting to protect the children from the things that had happened. But I mean, what's quite interesting, actually, I recently um, was well having some work done in the house and it obliged me to turn out some corners I haven't looked at for a long time. And um, I found some audio cassettes that I'd made about 40 years ago interviewing my mother. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, it's just weird listening to yourself because, you know, you're this young, naive person who doesn't know the right questions to ask. But um, I was prodding and prodding. I know then, you know, I was wanting to know about the family that I'd never known. And um, it isn't that she wasn't stonewalling me, but she wasn't telling me the things I really wanted to know. Um, and at one point in the conversation, I mean, I find this really interesting because... I'm sort of saying to her, I'm talking about our London relatives um, and their attitude to all of this, because I've been asking them as well. Um, and they were saying, the London relatives are saying, um, don't know what, you know, it's really not that interesting. Um, you know, what do you want to know about all these dead people for? Um, and they didn't understand that need, you know, that the next generation, my generation had this sort of sense of loss and, and who, who, where did you come from? Mm. Um, so, I, mean, it, I don't think it was a deliberate wall of silence. <laughs> it was just that um, it was a different time. And now, you know, in recent years, there's been this explosion of interest. And we didn't have it then. Mm. Um, it was just a completely different feel to everything. And, you know, I mean, I think it's just very good that we now know so much more, but it's, we have so many more ways of finding things out as well. Yeah. Um, which we didn't have then. So, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. No, thank you for that contribution, Helen. Because uh, there are two facets. The fact that you, you mentioned the vast expansion of information and IT, the availability And uh, sadly, as is so often the case, the absence is noticed more after their death than thinking, wish I'd asked certain questions and it's too late, which is why so many of us urge people to write their memoirs, speak to their children if they're interested, and why perhaps the, the context, the historical context is also important. And it's a question of identity for the children, too. And I had been wanting to ask you what you may consider a very personal question, so I apologize. But how do you feel in terms of your own personal sense of identity and knowing more about your personal family history has changed you or how you feel about it? Do you feel different? Do you feel more Jewish? Um, I wasn't brought up Jewish at all, at all, at all. My mother never mentioned it. It was not, we had visitors who came to see her from Canada, from um, Israel, but we never talked, she never ever talked about that. So it wasn't part of my upbringing at all. And I have a Jewish heritage, but my upbringing, you know, she was, I was very fortunate. She was actually a very positive person, Mm -hmm. like, And I, you know, I want to know about it, but it hasn't changed who I, who I how mm-hmm. I was born. Your no, self-perception. Yes, yes, it hasn't really. Mm-hmm. No. What is your self-perception? Is it English or is it European? Not, no, not really. Austrian? No, not Austrian at all. Um, not Austrian. I mean, I know she was yeah. from Austria, but you know, we went there a few times. But um, no, very much English, mm. very English attached to the countryside because I was brought up on a little farm. You know, that's my (laughs) very strong identity. Thank you. Are there any more questions or contributions and including from our viewers via Zoom? Mm -hmm. 
No, but Rachel says she's found your toe. She's found your, your your email online. She's had to go, but she'll get it got deck by email. So. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm, I'm thank just, you very much. I'm just reporting on the screen. <laughs> no, that's really appreciated. <laughs> thank you very much. So, so living in, in an area with a very high Orthodox popular Orthodox Jewish population, what is your sense of connectivity to that population? Um, this is Stoke Newington, by the way, Martin is there too. <laughs> you are, you are a Stoke <laughs> Yes, I, well, it's a very, very different culture from anything I'm familiar with. But also that's very different to, yeah. I mean, like Hasidic Jews are very different yes. to, the, I guess, the Jewishness that we're talking about, yeah. it feels like. Well, not all the people in the street are Hasidic. <laughs> what? No, but I suppose that's, that's what you're Jewish referring to. Jewish population Stoke Newington that isn't really dispersed from Hasidic <laughs> Most of those synagogues have closed. Yeah. They've turned The people on the street in Stoke Newington that you identify as Jewish are oh, <laughs> I was going to just say, make, I think that's really interesting what you were saying about how it's changed. I mean, I think it's also changed in history because the history for a long time of the post-war on the Holocaust was viewed as very objective and very much based on state papers and court proceedings, you know, like the Nuremberg trials. And, so. and it's really only from the 60s that you get an interest in social and oral history. And it's that, I think, before... And then you had an enormous turn to identity politics. But before that, the actual interest in subjectivity of the, and also of the victims and not just the perpetrators, which was the dominant thing. And in Germany, that was the big challenge in 68, was the attack of history about just focusing on the perpetrators without seeing. And that's partly why... One of the things that really bugs me is the lack of research that was done on Jewish resistance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was very much. And in fact, the foundation of Israel, the state of Israel, in a way played into that by arguing that, you know, never again, but meaning never again Jews will go, they're no warrior people, the Yabotinsky kind of line and the line of, you know, that's one direction from the Holocaust that, you know, it should be the armed warrior people armed with a state and so on. And, and on the other hand, the whole question of, of the degree to which Jews were involved in resistance, and, and not, not to um, romanticise, but there was also resistance which, which, which was completely unknown and wasn't researched at all. And yeah, also, the labor, I mean, it wasn't only Jewish, Jewish, but labor movement resistance as well in Germany, for example. Yes, yes, yes indeed. Film made in America called Facing Back. Yeah. Have you come across that? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yes, I think it is really much less known than, than other aspects of the Holocaust, and certainly in Poland. Yeah, and I think yeah. it's partly because the focus was not on uh, the interaction between uh, states, armies, ideology, fascism, but but you know also the 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 peoples who were conquered and the resistance that that yeah. came. So I, I think it's been very interesting that there has been this shift. I think that's not quite the same as what's happened with identity politics and with the internet and the whole thing of genealogy, which I personally find a bit strange. In a way. <laughs> uh, you know, the sort of, you know, a bit like the opposite of passing now is to, you know, go and see if you can find your roots. And I think that's not quite... What you were doing, I think you were surprised to, in a way, come across all this material and discover something you had no knowledge of, which is like, and I, I think that that's that is important, history, you know, for history, mm. for you mm. know, making it mm. just seeing how lives developed and were in a way uh, derailed by. Uh, 
Well, you've certainly worked hard on it. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no more contributions, and thank you very much for them, and no more questions, perhaps we'll close. And, um, can I just um, say something? Yes, just, sure. Yes, just before we finish. Um, so there are some books at the back if you are interested. And it's, the other thing is that um, some of us are going to have a chat in um, a place just it's called the riding house if you want to join us continue the discussion please do it's just opposite um russell square tube station in what's that place called russell square. yes yeah. not not brunswick. Brunswick. No. Brunswick, the brunswick center it's a place called riding house so should you want to join us just for a few minutes if you'd like to give out your email oh yes thank you marion thank you for well, somebody's thank thank you. pauline moves and moon says thank you that's thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay um i'll just it's marion.mcalpine at blueyonder.co.uk but if you look up marion mcalpine i've got a website so you'll see it there Very okay cool. sorry to interrupt no you. no problem at all um for future events which we hope you will attend Please do check the website. We have a visiting fellow who, once he's had a chance to do some more research, will be presenting a, a seminar paper. And Tom, uh, Tim, rather, sorry, would you like to mention your Zoom seminar, which might be of interest to people? Um, yes, I mean, by the end of this month, I think it's the tw uh, 29th. Yes. I'm totally sure there will be an online seminar that will basically talk about the topic of my dissertation that I finished two years ago. The, the title is Die Leere Zentrale, The Empty Center, Berlin, an image of post-war Germany. And probably some subjects will be uh, come back in, the, in my talk about Berlin. And I can assure you that Till is an excellent speaker. So it's worth listening to what he has to say. And that will be online, so you can register there. There's no charge, but by the same token, you absolutely must register, otherwise you won't have the link, I'm afraid, to, to take part. So first for me to thank you again. Thank you very much indeed. And all the